My name is, is Nick Johnston. I'm the head of the Structural Policy Division and the Director for Science, Technology and Industry here at the OECD. Uh, but I worked for 12 years in the Environment Directorate. Uh, but I worked in the Environment Directorate in collaboration with the Director for Science, Technology and Industry. So I sort of wear both a, an environmental economics hat and an innovation economics hat. And uh, what I'll try and do is wear the two hats at the same time today, if, if that's okay. Uh, I have to tell you, I did to switch the slides, so if you could go beyond the first slide to uh, the Inducing Environmental Innovation, the title slide, uh, there's a slide called the Environment Related Patents in OECD Countries. And I, I won't spend any time, actually what I'll do is I'll skip directly to the slide after that, which is called uh, Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Technologies. Uh, because the focus of the discussion I've seen for the last two speakers is very much about, about climate change, perhaps it makes more sense to, to cut right to the chase. Uh, at the OECD, we've been working a lot on uh, using patent data, developing indicators of innovation, drawing upon patent data. I recognize that a lot of people have problems with the use of patent data as a, as a, as a measure of innovation, but to be honest, it's, it's difficult to find much else out there that allows us to do the kind of analysis we like to do across countries and across years. And, and, and so we rely heavily upon patent data. And what we've tried to do is, is develop of search strategies, indicators of innovation in different environmental domains, climate change and other domains. And if you see in that slide there, uh, there's a, a dotted line which refers to the rate of innovation for high value patents. And the kind of work that we do, we throw out 95% of all of the patents because they're just not of any value uh, and use a particular indicator which we think is, is relatively robust in terms of quality. If you look at that, that figure, what you see is that the, the rate of innovation for sort of classic environment, innovation with respect to classic environmental media is somewhat lower than is the case for innovation in general. Making cars, making CDs, making whatever. Uh, but for many of the climate change uh, mitigation and recently adaptation related technologies, it is in fact somewhat higher. The levels are still quite low. Uh, it depends on the country, but in the region of say 10 to 15% of total patent technology could be said to be associated with some measure which is uh, associated with ameliorating the envir environmental conditions. Uh, but for the, for the most part, uh, uh, the, the figures are, are generally quite low, low in terms of levels, but the rate of growth, at least for climate change mitigation technologies, is, is very high. So obviously the question we, we've asked ourselves is how can we induce further innovation with respect to uh, environmental innovation so that it, it bends the trajectory of our economies in a direction uh, which is, uh, is green. Uh, if you slip next to the, to the next slide, and I, I very much appreciate the, the comments made by the last speaker, um, the OECD has about four or five mantras. One of those mantras is never pick winners. I'll come back to that one. Uh, another mantra is uh, get the prices right. We say get the prices right in the environmental domain, and that means use taxes and tradable permits. And we've been saying that for 25 years, and some countries have been listening to us, others haven't been listening to us, and I don't know who's right, whether or not they should be listening to us or not. My temptation is to think that they shouldn't be listening to us. In the course of, of doing this work, though, what we thought was it made more sense not to think in terms of individual instruments, but rather the underlying characteristics of the instruments. And the five elements which we think are very important about environmental policy research. And I want to emphasize here, I'm talking about environmental policy. I think there are, there are three kinds of market failures, broad kinds of market failures, which affect innovation, green innovation, let's say. One is the fact that you've got a, a property rights failure related to the environment. We all know about that. The second one is the more traditional innovation information related spillover type failure that you get in the, in the technology domain. But the third one, which is relatively less well understood, or, or, or relatively less analyzed in the context of, of environment-related innovation, is that which relates to more general market failures. If you look at most of our environment-intensive industries, they're actually industries which bear no relationship whatsoever to perfectly competitive markets. So frequently what you have is the coexistence of these three different types of, of, of market failures, all of which can uh, have an effect on the rates of, of innovation. But I will be focusing on environmental policy for the most part, but I'll come back to at the end of my talk to some of the other types of failures. So returning to my slide, what, is, what do we think are the important principles of environmental policy design in order to encourage green innovation? Whether it be a tax, whether it be a tradable permit system, whether it be a standard. 
The first, of course, is the level of, of stringency and ambition. And I won't say any more about that. Uh, I think that uh, that's self-evident. The higher the price, or the implicit or explicit price, the more innovation you're likely to get. We've known that since Hicks for the labor, and now we see it for environmental issues. But I think the second point is a, is a question of predictability and credibility of the policy regime. Uh, because many of the sectors in which we need to take, undertake these investments are those which imply very significant sunk costs. If we don't have a predictable policy regime, uh, and one which is credible over the longer term, so I think there's a slight difference between the sort of the predictability of the regime and its credibility over the longer term, then people just won't put money on the table in order to make the kind of investments. It's just too risky. And of course, most of the, most of the people out there who are undertaking the investments can deal very well with market uncertainty. Dealing with policy uncertainty is another issue altogether. Particularly dealing with policy uncertainty when you have both a domestic policy regime and you have interactions between all of these different national policy regimes and international policy regimes. That can add a whole level of uncertainty which is difficult for investors to deal with. The third one, of course, is flexibility. Flexibility with respect to the space given to potential inventors in order to identify the best way to meet a given environmental objective. Uh, in the work that we're doing, I'll, I'll make some reference to it in some of our empirical work, we find that the, that the role of policy flexibility, or the space that is granted to potential investors and adopters of technologies, uh, is an important inducement, at least as important as the stringency or ambition of the policy regime. The fourth point is, is, is incidents. Incidents of the policy, how closely it targets what you're really after, whether it be a good or a bad. Uh, to us, that is key, uh, insofar as when we look at sort of the environmental policy framework that most of our countries are introducing, for very good reasons, they do not target the good or the bad directly, primarily because of administrative costs. Getting at the good or the bad directly just costs too much in terms of administration costs and transaction costs. And for that reason, we're always targeting something to the left, to the right, above or below of what we really want to target. And that then induces an innovation, which over time can be increasingly far removed from that which we're really after. So it's a question of targeting. And then the fifth principle, which we think is exceedingly important, is the depth of the policy regime. Depth, by depth, we mean something different than stringency. What we mean by depth is whether or not it actually induces innovation all the way down to let's say zero emissions. So irrespective of the price or the regulatory standard, does it induce innovation? Does it provide incentives to find the solution which is uh, consistent with zero emissions? Now you don't want to get to zero emissions, of course, but you do want to have a policy which provide, could theoretically provide incentives over the whole continuum of possible outcomes. On that basis, we actually think that tradable permits and tax systems do quite well, but uh, there are also many regulatory standards which do quite well with respect to these five criteria, and, and I'll come back to that. So if we slip next, flip next to the next slide, the role of policy flexibility. Uh, I won't spend much time on sort of the results of our work, but I, I think that I'll, I'll just say two or three brief things. First of all, when it comes to, this is looking at work related to uh, the effects of levels of public research and development expenditures and their implications on uh, private sector innovation as reflected in patents in the environmental domain. Uh, looking at both the, the levels and changes in that level year on year. And what you see uh, when, when uh, uh, actually I've, I've slipped to the next slide, I'm, I'm very sorry for that, but I, I, I've slipped to the next slide of policy predictability. I, I, so if we could just slip to, flip to that side, slide please. And if you look at that closely, what you see then is that the effect of changes in the level of public support, in this case R&D expenditures on uh, environment-related innovation. We're using IEA data on uh, uh, research and development expenditures. Is at least as important as the level of those expenditures. So if you change your degree of support year on year, and we see that many governments do that, sometimes in a very discreet and, and brutal manner, uh, that can have very significant effects for the amount of money that people are willing to invest in environment-related in, inventions. That happens once. If it happens again and again and again, of course, once people get their fingers burned a few times, then they'll be less and less willing to undertake these kinds of investments, 
And I think that we're in the early stages of seeing some of the implications of brutal policy regimes that have taken, that have taken place in, in some OECD countries in re recent years. If we slip next to the, to the following slide there, which has the title, The Role of Policy Ambition. Now I'm in Europe, I'm in Paris. Uh, the European Union has been exceedingly ambitious with respect to the penetration of renewable energy uh, measures in, in renewable energy technologies in the electricity supply grid. Uh, in some cases, perhaps too generous. But what we're trying, what we've looked at in this particular case, is the effect of uh, a given level of, of, of support for uh, the penetration of renewable energies. In this case, feed-in tariffs and the implications that it has for financial deals. So effectively adoption, because it's financial deals encouraging investment in wind and solar in this case. And what we see in this case, in fact, is that it does support a significant amount of investment up to a certain point. Beyond a certain point, it actually has a decreasing effect. And this relates back to the point that I was making about credibility. There are many countries in, uh, who have introduced policy regimes which investors may not see to be credible in the longer term. They may fear that there could in fact be some kind of change in the policy regime or even expropriation. We saw that in Spain and we've seen it in some other countries as a potential hazard. So the point is that you want to have a policy regime which has desirable attributes but which uh, is most importantly seen to be something which holds water over the longer term. If we can just switch to the next slide now, please, um, which has the title of Comparison of Environmental Taxes and Technology-Based Standards. And this is a complete caricature, but I just want to go through how one might think about comparing the two different kinds of policies uh, in terms of these five criteria. So taxes can, of course, be ambitious. For the most part, they're not ambitious. And why are they ambitious? Well, mainly for political economy reasons. Uh, but on occasion, they have been ambitious. The one example where I'd like to cite is the Swedish NOx charge. The Swedish NOx charge did something which no economist or no public finance economist would ever advocate. It more or less hypothecated all the revenue and redistributed it back to the electricity sector, but in a manner which had nothing to do with marginal incentives, right? It had nothing to do with emissions. So what this meant, in fact, is that it was an ambitious policy which violated all rules of public finance economics but if they hadn't done so, they never would have been able to introduce it. And I think that's a question of the trade-offs between political realities and what you need and can do in order to induce the kind of innovation that we'd like to see take place. They can have direct incidence, but actually, at the OECD, we always say market-based instruments should be used. For the most part, that means taxes or tradable permit systems, and in many cases, they have nothing to do with directly targeting the good or the bad. So our advocacy of market-based instruments in some ways has been misused, or we ourselves have misused it, and describe anything which is a tax as potentially being beneficial, even though it can be very far removed from that which one seeks to uh, address, the environmental externality. Then, of course, I mentioned flexibility. Taxes and tradable permits can be flexible, predictable, and credible. Credibility is a big issue, as I've mentioned. And then they provide these incentives. So then we look at the other side, technology-based standards. They can be ambitious, and for many cases they're ambitious in fact because they are not as transparent, or the implications to them, to the broader community, are not as transparent, except potentially to the regulated, regulated community. But I think an important point is that when they are ambitious, they are often discriminatory, for, discriminatory towards entrance. A large percentage of our policies are in fact discriminating for entrance relative to incumbents. And we see that across the entire uh, OECD. And it's a very significant concern and has huge implications for innovation because it's entrance, which in many cases are those which will carry forward, bring through the breakthrough technologies that we're looking for. They have indirect incidents, almost by definition. Uh, they're generally inflexible, although performance-based standards can be, and I'm, I want to distinguish clearly between performance-based standards and technology-based standards can be as flexible, of course, as tradable permit systems or taxes. And they can be predictable and credible over, at least in the short run. And finally, big point, they only provide incentives to the point of the standard. Beyond that standard, of course, they don't provide uh, any inducements for innovation. So that's a general point, a general framework. And now I'd like to 
sort of skip with, with the, the discussion, sort of the basic neoclassical discussion of what we might just look for in an environmental policy regime, and think in more political terms. Nick, so we skip the next Nick, slide, can you hear me? Crisis. Nick, yep. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, it's Marty. You don't have the yes, advantage. You don't have the advantage of our timekeeper, but just to let you know that you're uh, running up to your 15 minutes pretty soon. So, a okay. couple more minutes. So I'll, I'll okay. conclude with a, a few points. If we skip with the, the, the slide which shows the prices for innovation and go to the next slide, uh, which has a necessary but necessar not necessarily sufficient condition. Uh, what do I mean by that? I just mean quite simply that I think unless you have prices or implicit or explicit prices to induce innovation, you're pushing on a string. But it's not enough to have that price for the reasons that I mentioned before, because you have this joint existence of different kinds of problems in the market. So I think what you need to think clearly about is what other measures that you might have that could induce the kinds of innovation that we want to see. And I, I won't ask you to keep going through the slides. In fact, I think I'll, I'll just finish by talking more generally about uh, the issues that were raised by previous speakers. Uh, I think that the, has, the biggest policy conundrum that we face now is the importance of directing technological change without picking winners, or by picking winners in a manner which reduces risks. Uh, in the past, uh, I know from previous experience at the OECD, I've been slapped on the hand any number of times for suggesting things which imply picking winners, but the fact of the matter is, is that all of our governments are doing so. And I think there's a few criteria that we need to keep in mind uh, as we try to think about what governments can do. If prices are not enough, then we have to have something which is prescriptive in some nature, something which induces the kind of innovation that we want to see in the longer term. And I think this, first of all, I think it's necessary to support, and I, sort of at odds with what was said by the previous speaker, support a portfolio of technologies, not diversify so, too far. And in fact, there's a very interesting group of six countries, small economies, advanced economies, that are looking at what do you do in a small economy when you don't have the basket to have a full portfolio, you don't have the financial resource to have a full portfolio of technologies to which you can support, how do you identify the right limited basket? That's one point. I think the other point is that the benefits associated with, with, with choosing different technologies should be robust with respect to problems of information. And what do I mean by that? I mean that even if you get it wrong, that you get some ancillary benefits out of that. So that even if you address, think that you're addressing climate change in a manner which is ideal, if you are concerned that you might have information problems, that you might get it wrong, if there are ancillary benefits, such as local air pollutants or other environmental issues, that that diversifies your risk indirectly. And I think that's a sensible, a sensible choice as well. But thirdly, and I think this is the most important one, I think we need to start thinking about identifying what I call general purpose environmental technologies. Technologies which can have beneficial environmental consequences uh, uh, irrespective of what precise emission reducing strategy that we take. And I'll give one example of that. European countries have been throwing a huge amount of money at renewable energy generating technologies, but not nearly enough at grid management and storage. And in fact, if we look at the balance of that, if they had thrown more money at grid management and storage, and provide more inducement in that area, then irrespective of whatever renewables took off, they would have benefited from doing so. It benefited disproportionately relative to more polluting technologies. So I'll just conclude with that, uh, because I know that I'm running out of, of, of time, but I will say one final point in, in, with respect to the nature of the, the work that we're doing now which is to look at the kinds of conditions which generate radical or breakthrough technologies, uh, and in particular the policy framework which can bring about radical or breakthrough technologies. Most importantly, because all of our estimates of, of the cost of climate change, in the, of addressing climate change in the long run, uh, stand or fall on assumptions made about, uh, of the, about these breakthrough technologies in the next 50 years or so. So I've gone over time and I apologize for that and I apologize for the hiccups previously with respect to technology. Thanks very much.